whole body of work here um, that Gene brings, and I'm really excited to hear about what you're going to be talking about today. I have no idea what it is. Okay, well, you'll hear <laughs> more about the Wallawas today. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I say, Pacific Northwest is an amazing place. Uh, it has, I think, in, in the U.S., but maybe the last place to really be kind of uh, gotten a hold of or grasp of what's going on. Um, this is mostly just while I'm talking, but you can see there are the Wallawas, and it's at the end of the Snake Plain, the old age end of it, and it forms this intriguing bullseye structure I want to talk about. So much of the talk will be why that bullseye got created, or not why, how it got created. <clears throat> well, I don't know how, I'll tell you what I think happened. Um, and um, of course, this talk relates a lot to the Columbia River basalts, or the CRBs, um, but also as much I think about lithospheric instabilities. Uh, you know, continental lithosphere has frozen into it all sorts of reasons to be unstable and things happen and it can come apart in various ways. And Yellowstone uh, basically created the conditions that let a lot of instabilities loose in the Eastern Oregon area. And it'll be as much about that uh, as it is about the CRBs. Um, let's see what I got here. Oh. I had to put this down. Uh, I've been thinking about the CRBs for a long time. Uh, and so I just made a quick list of people who I've uh, talked to and worked with in various ways. Uh, highlighted various students and postdocs who contributed maybe, uh, well, the students and postdocs that contributed the bulk of this. <laughs> uh, I'm just along for the ride. And a pretty picture. I think most people are probably pretty familiar with the CRBs here. Um, Okay, but I want to start a little bit by saying there's a classic uh, story for flood basalts. And this comes from Mark Richards and people. Uh, but anytime you see a hot spot and you can trace it back to the beginning, you find a flood basalt. Anytime you see a flood basalt, you trace away from it, you see a hot spot track. Okay, maybe anytime it's a slight exaggeration, but you get the idea. So how do you explain that? And a very simple model was created that I think has a lot of merit to it and well, not complete. Uh, but the idea is at the core mantle boundary, you're heating the lower mantle, uh, making low viscosity buoyant uh, mantle. And it starts to rise. It's pushing this mantle out of the way slower than it's filling because it's low in viscosity. So as it rises, you fill this plume head, okay? And one of the predictions is as it gets near the surface, before eruption, it's actually pushing up on the surface and creating this uh, uplift. Then it hits, you get a flood basalt, and as the plate moves up, you see a hot spot track um, from that. Okay, uh, I want to say that, that is not the CRB. Uh, there are things about it that are not that. Uh, well, I put down here no pre eruptive uplift. That actually may be common to many flood basalts, so maybe not just this one. Um, and uh, this predicts the flood basalt is the plume impact at the surface. And I think, you know, based on Ray's work uh, in, in Duncan, um, it looks like Yellowstone was active before it was overridden by North America. So this is its reemergence, if you will. And I think uh, I proceed as that is uh, being the truth. Okay, um, here are a few things about the Klimber basalts that uh, are quite intriguing. First of all, it starts where it should, okay? Uh, by should, I mean you basically backtrack the Yellowstone trend and it starts down here in the Steens area. Okay, those are the first basalts that erupt. Uh, though I should add that people have different ideas where the Yellowstone plume actually was beneath this whole system. Uh, personally, I kind of like it here, uh, but uh, who knows? Other people suggest other places, uh, but here are the first eruptions. So that seems to fit this idea of a hot spot pretty well. But then very quickly, you had from the Steens to the Amaha to the Grand Ronde eruptions, you see in time, 80,000 years, uh, based on the most recent dating. Uh, that is phenomenally fast. Uh, okay, and the Grand Ronde all the way into Washington. Okay, I'll say that's a little bit deceiving, but that's the idea. Uh, and then on from there, well, the Grand Ronde being by far almost three fourths of the total basalt. That's the big part of the event. And then it starts petering out after that. Um, okay, uh, some things that are very not 
uh, flood basalt like about that is while it started here, this rapid motion off track, very far north, it's not what you normally expect. And then it's getting bigger, not at the beginning, but as it propagates north. So all those uh, seem to be surprising. Okay. Um, what else do I have here? Well, I already mentioned that. So anyway, I make the comment here. Um, as we understand this particular event, we see these strange things. I really wonder if you want the other flood basalts around the world, you could study them uh, and pick apart the details as thoroughly if they are also equally as strange in various ways. Um, but who knows? Um, okay, uh, so a quick summary so you know where I'm going uh, in terms of the instabilities. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is I think there are some lithosphere beneath the Pacific Northwest, beneath Eastern Oregon in particular, uh, that peeled off during this event, uh, triggered by Yellowstone. And here's an image of it. I'll say more about this later. Uh, but there it is. You see there's 300 kilometers, so it's descended quite a ways. Um, and then uh, this is a tomographic image. I'll say more about that. Uh, the second instability is simply the extension uh, that occurred in Eastern Oregon. And you have a fair amount of extension to accommodate all these dikes, or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, the dikes may not have caused the extension, the extension may have enabled the dikes. Um, and then the third thing, and maybe most of the talk, uh, might actually be the strange bullseye with the wows in the middle. Um, okay, uh, and I think uh, since I mentioned that image, I want to talk a little bit about the tomography just because uh, it's an important part of this whole talk. Okay, um, so here we are at 200 kilometers. Here we see the Juan de Fuca slab going into the earth. Uh, and what is all this stuff back here that is as significant as a Juan de Fuca slab? And how to interpret that? Um, and this anomaly in particular, which is something below the Wallawas, is going to be the important aspect of this talk. Um, okay, interpretation of this, uh, we know enough about what makes mantle uh, past seismic waves, fast or slow. Uh, and the main thing is its temperature. In fact, the only thing that could make it 1% fast is being cool. So we color code it that way. Uh, so anything blue in here is cool stuff. Um, and if it's cool, it was made near the surface. You can't make something cool in the interior of the earth. So this is something that is not ancient, that was from the surface and descended into the earth. Um, you gotta say that, um, just thinking geologically, anything west of the Cretaceous arc or the Paleozoic hinge line, uh, anything out here, there is not enough North America lithosphere and thickness to account for these structures. Okay, so the only thing left, I think, is oceanic slab. Okay, and it even looks pretty slab like. Okay, so we're looking at pieces of old ocean lithosphere that is not ancient, okay? Uh, and so really the only thing available to us up here, I think, is Fairlong lithosphere uh, that's abducted, uh, let's say in the last 100 million years or something like that. We could find that more, but it's not older than that or it would have warmed up more. Uh, total side comment, in the end, if I get that far, I found this very uh, surprising because I'll tell you some of this stuff has been here for like 50 million years or thereabouts. And I thought ocean slab was supposed to drive convection in the earth and sink. And there it is up in the upper mantle. I'll come back to that issue if that's worrying you at this point. Uh, okay, um, well, I should point out, uh, I mentioned this, I mean, there, there's a piece of Wyoming, I mean, Craton and the Medicine Hat Craton. There where you have Cratonic mantle, we know it typically goes down to about 200 kilometers. But we're all west of that. Okay, uh, so I want to go through with a few slides the tectonic uh, history of the Pacific Northwest. And then you could be done with it for this term. Huh? <laughs> no, uh, this is, I worked hard to make this as brief as possible. Uh, okay, uh, and to me, maybe one of the most simple guides I have for the Western US tectonics that seems to work very well is where you have, when you have subduction and no volcanism, but you have thrust tectonics going on there, all these being thrust faults. Um, the, the way to explain that is flat slab subduction, which uh, is an interesting process in its own right. I'm not gonna talk about the dynamics of that, 
But here's a slab, a fairly long slab, for instance, sliding right beneath North America and keeping the acenosphere away from the plate. So no volcanism. And as it drags the continent along, it's driving the stress faults. That, that's now a fairly classic story for the southwest of the US. Um, but I think it applies equally as well up here. Uh, and after the Idaho Bath stopped receiving mantle melts, you had no magmatism here from the mantle uh, since, what do I say, 83 million years, according to Gashnik people. So to me, flat slab subduction. The other half of this story is when that slab comes off, now you have a lithosphere that's been hydrated by this slab under cool conditions. It comes off, you see the sphere comes up, and you get magmatism in abundance. Okay, so no magmatism was protected, and tons of magmatism when this peels off, the sphere ascends, decompression melts, and hits a fertile base of North America. Uh, and this is the Nimbrite flare. Okay. Uh, I think uh, for the Cenozoic Western US interior, uh, that's most of the history uh, in, in a nutshell right there. Um, so for the Pacific Northwest, uh, here is at 55 million years, shortly before Celestia arrives, fair long subduction, I say inactive Cretaceous arc. It was active when the Idaho bath of Sierra Nevada were active, but it turned off uh, 85 -ish million years ago. So flat slab subduction to this region, driving thrust faulting uh, beneath the Northwest and further South. There's a little cartoon of it. Um, when this, when Celestia accretes, we are no longer moving this slab. It stalls, it's still moving here. So we must tear it through here somehow. And when Celestia accretes, we have a slab boundary here and coming off. And I say that just because we have tons of volcanism. The slab was still flat, we wouldn't have it. And to get that much volcanism, we have to remove it, let these scenes here come up. So to me, this is the chalice, you have a chalice, Absarica, Kamloops, and all that. And coincident with that is um, all these core complexes. These are extensional areas. Uh, remember, just before, we had thrusting in this area. So it is amazing how almost overnight, we get this incredible big swish between amagmatic thrusting in the interior, the very magmatic and extensional Western US. Not everywhere at once. But in the Pacific Northwest, that happens more or less simultaneous with Celestia accretion. Okay, and I think what's happening here when this accretes is, of course, we start new subduction outboard at Cascadia, but the old slab has to come off. I just show it delaminating there and coming off um, to let the chalice happen. Is that all making sense? Oh, I never asked that right. Is that not making sense? <laughs> okay. Um, and to give credence to that, here's the idea of the parallel slab coming off, and there it is. Okay, we image it in the mantle, and it's big. Uh, goes down to in places 400 kilometers, very slab like structure. Um, okay, and so over here is just a map of all the volcanism uh, I could find uh, in the literature, um, you know, from Pasco Basin to Seracas and Okanagan area, and so on. All around, those are places where the slab must have come off to let that volcanism happen. Okay. Um, here's one place where we didn't get any volcanism. Okay. Uh, and to me, uh, that's where the flat slab still is. Nope, still was <laughs> uh, until 17 million years ago. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to zoom into that area, but to me, the, the story of the, um, the CRBs is this slab is going to come off, it's actually going to peel off from the south, north, drawing everything north with it, and then we see the anomaly here now, the northern end of this. Okay. Um, okay. So delamination uh, is the first lithospheric instability of the three I want to talk about. And so a little cartoon is say where I'm going. Uh, cross section, there's a slab that's peeled off. Yellowstone plume has been sucked in, or maybe just buoyantly driven in, both really. And the lock, lack of this weight and addition of this buoyancy has uplifted the western, uh, eastern Oregon area. Um, okay. 
Um, so uh, there are two things that propagate south and north. Uh, one of them is the volcanism I already mentioned. So here's a picture of it again. And then you see the rapid migration north. Um, and I will talk about the actual flows themselves. Um, steams are the first. They're deposited in this area. That looks like a large basin of some sort to me. Uh, because these are big flows. They didn't get much beyond that. Every subsequent flow, the southern end is farther and farther north. And every subsequent flow flows out into the Columbia embayment and uh, on out from there. Okay, so to me, what I see in this is a map of growing uplift to the Naha four Grand Ron units, one of them in Saddle Mountains. Okay, so I don't know how high, I'd love to know what kind of uplift is involved, but enough to keep this flow from going back. Um, oh, I already said pretty much that. Uh, that's the, just to say the growth of the plateau. Um, if I look in the mantle at this, what I see, and here's the cartoon for the slab beneath, let's say, the Washington Oregon border. Here's the Eastern Oregon plateau that's been uplifted. And if I look in this cross section, uh, Here's where the slab was, where the volcanism didn't happen until now, and it peeled off, and there it is. Okay. Um, in fact, that doesn't make it all the way to the surface. I'll say a few words about uh, in a few minutes. Um, but again, that's, that blue stuff is so large uh, and cold that it has to be a piece of ocean lithosphere. And I think it probably is what came off driving the CRB event to the north. I might say in the general terms, uh, this is going to make the CRBs much bigger than it would have been. It would have just been the steams without this. Okay. It is also uh, given a lot of structure to this whole event. It didn't just make a blob underneath uh, southeastern Oregon. It's actually pulling everything north. Um, so it is this lithospheric instability that's important here. Okay. Um, so uh, just a, a more of a trying to get a little more quantitative. Uh, well, first of all, here's the cartoon. The also plume comes up. Here's the slab. This allows it to detach and come off. Now, for delamination, you need two things. Uh, like this is kind of a general comment on geodynamics overall. You need one, a weak attachment. So you gotta have enough weakness for this thing to occur. So somehow you gotta detach this thing from the surface where it was kind of stuck on. And two, this has to be heavy enough that its own load uh, can drive it into sinking into the earth. Okay, and of course, in this case, the detachment comes from Yellowstone. Uh, in particular, to move that fast probably melts uh, decompression melting and then plugging out, making a sill on top of this feature and letting it decouple from, from uh, Eastern Oregon. Of course, the weight of the slab is going to drive it uh, to sink. Uh, so, uh, and here's a little mark model that uh, a student ran. Um, I gotta say, he left before I wanted. Uh, he's now doing AI for automatic driving someplace. I don't know. <laughs> he seems very happy. <laughs> he was good with computers. But anyway, this is initial stage of delamination where you see it starting to, the slab starting to come off. And his comment at this point was you know, really, this is kind of boring um, because, of course, once the melt gets in there and there's no problem getting in there, it's detached. And if it's heavy, it's going to come off. And uh, you know, it's, this is it's going to happen. And you can try whatever parameters you think are right. You could take Joe's parameters and Frank's parameters and try them, and they'll all work. It's a very simple, robust process once you can detach it. Um, and what really rate limits this whole thing uh, probably is how fast mantle can flow in behind it as this thing sinks which could be any rate you want, because we don't understand mental viscosity all that well. Um, okay, but anyway, that's the story uh, for the delamination. Um, kind of a, a comment, the uplift I talked about looked very progressive as you swole up the, the elevation from Southern Oregon going north. Uh, the magnetism propagated north too. When we look at the uppermost mantle just below the Moho, um, here's an image at 55 kilometers. And what we see, this is south of where the slab was, 
or the tear went through here someplace. So the things happened where the slab wasn't, it was already gone. Okay. But then we have these two areas where it looked like cavities within the North American lithosphere. Not the Fairlawn slab, but we've actually taken off some of the North American lithosphere. Uh, this one is where John Wolf, and I think most people would say the main magma chamber was. Okay. And probably having for the Imnaha, which rapidly evolved into the Grand Rock. Um, okay. And, and uh, so the fact that we get Grand Ron erupting in dikes up here, it looks like the magma is actually coming from here and then propagating north in dikes. Um, then we see this cavity at the very northern end. And I don't know what to say about that too much, but it's uh, maybe where some of the one of them came from. Uh, probably the Saddle Mountains are different enough from the Grand Ron that it needs a different chamber. So that might be what that's about. Uh, I mean, that isn't the chamber, but that's the mantle hole that let the xenosphere well up and produce the magnets that gave rise to those flows. Um, okay, the second is stability. Now, I don't know what kind of background people have. This is, this is the boring one. There are two neat ones, the one I talked about and the one I will talk about next, but this one is pretty simple uh, if you uh, thought about it. And the idea is if you take the lithosphere and you elevate it, you produce a force that wants to cause spreading. It's a mid-ocean ridge force if you want. They just want to slide downhill. So the force there that wants to drive extension, okay? Um, it could be strong enough that it will resist that, but if you make it weak, and that's sort of in the lithosphere, make it weak, then it has the two requisite uh, pieces for, uh, for deformation. Uh, forces drive in deformation and the strengths are not resisting it anymore. Okay. Okay, so there is the gravitational force. And if it's weak enough, it will actually deform. And I just show some stretching the lower crust and some dikes uh, up on top to get the idea through. Um, okay, so uh, maybe one slide or so on this. Uh, Eastern Oregon, again, from I think one of Wolf's maps, uh, his chamber area. But the amount of extension that people have uh, measured really. Uh, 250 meters, 400 meters of extension, and undoubtedly more than that, because this is what's exposed. Uh, this is from uh, Morris and Karlstrom's work. You see the areas where the exposures are, the dikes, and the amount of extension uh, associated with those. Okay. Um, so that's a fair amount of extension. I should say that if, if you think about the tectonic stress producing some tension, uh, or, minimal compression, but I'll say tension, it only takes a few dikes to remove whatever tension you think should be there, okay? If you keep getting more and more dikes, the only way to do that is you gotta keep moving this country over and make room for it. We recreate that tension to allow the dikes in, in that orientation. Um, it's interesting, uh, Ray Weldon has been working in Central Oregon and during the time of the Grand Ronde eruptions, he's seen rapid shortening here. Okay, so just kinematically, it really looks like extension, contraction, that kind of show this wedge rotating out. Now, what the deformation field really looks like, I'm sure is more interesting than that, but that's about what we know at this point, is it looks like this is sliding off and actually compressing this area. Okay, it's not pushing all of Oregon over the subduction zone, for instance. Um, this actually looks very similar to what's going on today, Instead of having the buoyancy in Eastern Oregon, we now have the buoyancy underneath the corner of Wyoming at Yellowstone, and we see everything moving out and rotating around and driving contraction. Well, in Portland and the Yakima Folding Thrust Belt. So, kind of a similar process in many ways. This, this whole scale has opened up as Yellowstone is propagated in. Uh, okay, the third instability. Uh, the first thing I want to say is. This is a post CRB event, okay? Uh, we have a, maybe a couple of little flows in the Saddle Mountains, maybe 1% or less of everything. But by and large, this is after the CRB event. You see the various flows, uh, including the Saddle Mountains that just go up and over all this. So all this vertical motion we're seeing that makes this bullseye and the Wallows uh, is all after the flood basalt event, okay? Uh, in fact, that's what got Hills interested in this in the first place, is he was 
he's a geomorphologist flying over the Wallow Mountains with his advisor. He says, what's all that basalt doing on top of the Wallow Mountains? Okay, how did it get on top of the mountains after all? Well, we lift the mountains up. Um, okay, so this is the post CRB event. Um, and I'm gonna talk about it in three parts. Uh, you see here the outer ring, the law uplift, and the intervening moat that separates the two. Uh, and they're all kind of interesting. Um, okay, making the outer ring. This part is pretty simple for the most part. We already have a plateau. And so imagine this area being uplifted. I'm just showing a plateau where the flood basalt kind of indicate the elevation was high. The flows are falling off, and here's where the saddle mountains and water from work. So this is a high standing area. And now we're going to raise the lawas and drop down the moat on top of this overall regional uplift at the northern end of this eastern Oregon plateau, uh, as I see it. The northern ring I'll have to come back to. Um, but as a simple statement, I'd say in the end, the delaminated slab got that far, what you see up here is the northern end of a plateau that was made after delamination finished all the way. So no too surprising of a thing. Um, okay, the central uplift. Um, you know, we're west of the 706 line or the suture uh, of these accreted terrains with you know, more uh, granitic type cotton. Uh, but there are granites in this area. And the biggest granitic body is the Wallow Baffler. Okay. And so you look at the Wallow Baffler, and well, I think it's probably the next slide. Zooming into the Wallow Baffler, uh, what uh, TC Hills did is just look at the very slow interfaces and map them. And you can see to the first order, these are like layers of an onion that got deformed. Okay. You look more closely. And you can see deformation is going on during the CRB event itself, but most of it afterwards. Um, and you see an elevation, two kilometers. Here is out in the uh, Columbia embayment and uh, adjoining area. And the Wawas are up two kilometers compared to that area. Okay, that's quite a bit of uplift. Uh, here is the Snake River down here. And the flows in the very bottom here are the same flows that are on top of the Lyle Mountains. And they're so close, if you had a good arm, you could almost throw a frisbee that far. Okay. Um, so it's pretty amazing concentrated uplift. Um, so what could cause that? Well, of course, I think uh, uh, this is coming out of the same time people were worried about uh, the uplift of the Southern Sierra Nevada. And the story there really follows Sue Kay's work in the Andes. Uh, where when you make granite, you're segregating the rock and the dense part goes down and the light part, that is the granite, goes up, okay? And you form like five to 10 times as much dense rock as buoyant rock and where is it all, okay? And this is Sue Kay's story, really. Um, well, it falls off, okay? Keep forming dense rock, rock denser than the mantle and you keep dropping it off into the earth, okay? And how dense it is depends on conditions. Uh, but here is the granite body, and it is the granite body that elevated and only the granite body. Okay, it looks so distinctly like this uh, boundaring of a root to me um, that uh, that's, that's what I'm going to attribute it to. And I'll say more about that in a slide or two, but there's the cartoon for it. Well, back with root, also is beneath it. So now the slab that was underneath that root is off, okay? So it can come off, okay? And so there it is. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not a geochemist. Uh, so correct me if I speak incorrectly here. But anyway, this is a standard kind of plot for looking at the granites in the Western US. You see here is Peninsula Range of Sierra Nevada, and here are the Lyle granites. And it's an indication of how much segregation occurred or if it occurred in the garnet stability field in particular, okay? Garnet has properties of taking on certain elements uh, very easily. So you see strontium, but yttrium is the one people really pay attention to on this. Uh, and so the granites 
um, themselves uh, indicate that the, they are absent of the granite or of the garnet composition, uh, and the root supposedly got it during the segregation event. Okay, and you see it in the spinogram too, um, in terms of uh, the garnet rich root keeps producing more and more strong trends uh, in the spinogram. Okay, um, so if you look at all the Western US granites, you see the ones that did not have that segregation uh, in the garnet stability field fall down here for the most part. And as they trend up in this direction, supposedly that happened in the garnet stability field. And the late stage Wallowa granites in particular are some of the most anomalous of all. Okay, now I'm focusing on garnet because that's a very dense mineral. That's what makes the root exceptionally dense. Okay, so the, the summary of this is the chemistry really suggests the Wallowa bathlip had a very dense root. Okay, how dense? Well, to me, how dense is just how high did the bath will rise when you took the root off. Okay, and that was a lot. Okay, um, making the moat. And I'll say another word about the uh, boundary and root as well. Uh, Wallows, Wallow Fault, there's a cross section across it. Here's looking at the Wallows uh, from uh, Terminal Gravity Brew Pub, I think, or somewhere thereabouts. <laughs> um, and to me, this is a kind of an unnervingly uncomfortable uh, view. I'm used to normal faults around the Western US. Okay, uh, think of the Tetons, for instance. Yeah, the Teton range up, and as the Teton range goes up, the valley drops down. So it's like dropping down, filled with sediment, lakes right against the mountain, uh, you know, like a Ginny Lake or Jackson Lake. Uh, and that's typical everywhere, except here. Okay, here, this tilts up towards the mountain. That's backwards. I think uh, Matthew Morris called it the abnormal fault. Okay. Um, and here's a cross section from Spitzer and Carlson, and you see the CRVs go up. This isn't in some artifact of uh, sediment being shut off or something. The hanging wall actually does go up compared to out here. So, how to explain that? Well, I'll say if the lava root has fallen off, there is a huge hole in the base of the crust. Okay, and the lower crust has to flow in to fill that hole. It's the only source for it. So that's what this little picture is showing. There's a crust flowing in in what used to be a hole. Uh, and as it flows in, it's evacuating the crust uh, from around the wallows. Okay, so the moat is actually, in this story, a uh, evacuation event uh, in the proximity of the uplift or of the hole. So I think that's really kind of neat, uh, an idea I hadn't heard before. Uh, so it's fun. Um, I say here the timing is around 10 million years. So I'll just emphasize post CRB. Um, here's another view, um, working more with seismologists. I used to be a seismologist. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so a student, uh, Jorge, and then Rob Clayton, uh, got involved in this project. And here is the anisotropy in the crust. Now to say a word about it, this means the crust the side the surface waves are traveling faster in the direction of the bar. And we typically think of what makes it fast is strain in the crust, aligning the crystals. So this is oftentimes used as a map of flow in the crust. This is the mantle, we take it as flow in the mantle. Okay. And what you see here in the wallows, and you see the flow seems to come in to the wallows. It looks like uh, quite originally uh, we mobilized the, the lower crust, well, the mid crust, I should say, um, which totally blew my mind. I got to admit, I tend to be rather conservative until I'm beaten off of that view. Uh, and so I didn't believe much in lower crustal flow in most conditions, especially over such an area. Uh, I'll come back and say there's another half of this story, so I'm exaggerating right now. Um, but you'll, <clears throat> but you get the idea. Um, okay, so the whole story, whole is probably uh, to be put in quotes here, but uh, here's the root. We uplift the whole area. We drop the root, the wilds come up and sucks the crust in from around it, uh, producing the moat. Okay, so there is for the most part, the bullseye. 
uplift the moat and the surrounding ring being the remnants of the old plateau. <clears throat> okay, well, and I just said that, I guess. Uh, but there shows Yellowstone plume beneath it helping hold the whole area up. Um, <clears throat> I haven't gotten to the outer, the northern part of the outer ring. It seems like a small part of the whole thing, but I think an important part. Um, okay, so here's the elevation again. This used to be the plateau, as far as I infer from the distribution of the basalts themselves. This area has gone down. That's the Western Snake River Plain. I'm not too interested in that today, but like the rest of the Snake River Plain, it is almost certainly due to a lot of magma, basaltic magma being interjected into the crust, loading the crust, and the whole crust sacks. That's a well-established story for the Eastern Snake River Plain, but it's also seemingly true here as well. The only thing important about that is if this goes down, it helps define the southern end of that ring uh, more, more profoundly. Um, this is the area I'm interested in now. The northern part of this ring has yet to go up. And so how do I get that up? Um, well, here's a look. Okay, north. Here's Oregon marching towards Spokane. And here is this basin in here. Along that cross section, here you see the various flows uh, in Maha, Grand Ronds. And what I've done is taken all those flows and flattened them out, move them each one vertically uh, along the lower to upper saddle mountain deposits. Um, so I can see what things look like in terms of relief that was filled in before the saddle mountain uh, upper flows. And what you see in this area is a big basin was created, okay, and filled up with Grand Ronds, the you know, one, two, three uh, in here, reverse normal, reverse two. That's about a half a kilometer of basin that was filled up with basalt. Uh, certainly the basalt helped push it down, but it's a pr pretty good basin. You pulled that local area down, okay, and then you have to release it. Here's the current topography coming through and then it stays low all the way north to Spokane. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is the slab is rolling back, everything behind it is being lifted up, but here you have the slab pulling things down. Uh, so you've lowered, imagine a front of low line country be, be ahead of the uplifted Eastern Oregon Plateau, marching along, and they can see here, the lamination stops, uh, you get this detachment, and this thing is going to sink down to here, uh, where it is now fairly stable. Okay, so the lower this slab pulls it down, it's going to sink in the crust. This detaches, lets the whole thing rebound back up, at least partly. Okay, so that's how I'd attribute uh, the northern uh, gap, the northern rim of the, uh, of the bullseye. Um, a few more words to say uh, across this, I guess I flipped it around, but here's north now, Washington, Oregon border. Uh, right in this area where it looks like the slab ends, we see a, a great thickening of the crust. Okay, here's a seismic image of it. Uh, receiver functions, if that means anything. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Uh, but you see, you know, a, a lot of thickening of the crust. Uh, one thing to mention in this is that is a large sink for lower crust, just like the hole was under the Wallows. I got to fill this with crust. So again, I needed a crustal flow event to fill that hole. Uh, and so if I look up here, you sort of see there is where the crust is thick. You can't see the sign of crust flowing into that area too. They each are roughly equivalent in volume. Okay, so. If I just kind of look at it, well, first before I do that, here is the map, here is the bullseye, just for reference, and here's where the crust is thick, you know, uh, 10 to 20 kilometers thicker than what's around it. That is a remarkable, anomalous uh, piece of Eastern Oregon. Um, okay. And it's right, up, that's right where the slab is pulling it down. And you see signs to me, uh, this is sort of maybe over interpretation, I see signs of the flow into the Wallows coming down. I also see signs of flow into this area, but they both have drawn mantle into that general region, uh, exciting this regional crustal flow, it appears. Okay. And perhaps 
another part of the story I'm not going to get to uh, up north, but uh, certainly a strong flow radially into uh, the, the area of the northern bullseye. Okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I said, you can stop here if your brain is full. Uh, but uh, I want to go on with a few things. And you see, uh, I want to talk about the real load, not just simply being the slab, but the oceanic crust of the slab, where it's turned to eclogite. Okay, eclogite is an interesting uh, rock in this world in a lot of ways. And I want to talk about why those slabs seem to be hanging out in the mantle as though they weigh nothing. I shouldn't say weigh nothing, as though they're neutrally buoyant. Okay, um, and some other things like why delamination stopped where it did. Okay. Um, okay, uh, lots of slab hanging around. How do you do that? Um, well, if slab, when, sl when ocean slab subducts, the mantle and the crust go down together. Maybe the next slide might show part of this. Let me start here. Um, so here is a slab. If the slab is held up at all, most models would suggest that the crust can't stay on it. If it, more likely than not, slides off. It's dense eclogite and it just slides off the top of the depleted mantle. If it doesn't do that, it'll melt off. Okay. Um, but so the general thought is that the crust is gone. No eclogite, which would be the densest rock in this picture, it's gone. The depleted mantle, okay, it's depleted because we've taken the crust out of it. We've taken iron out of it. We've taken uh, aluminum out of it, which is what you need for garnet. And this then is relatively buoyant compositionally compared to what's around it, okay? And for a young slab, if you just run the standard numbers, young ocean plate without its crust is neutrally buoyant. It's cold, it's seismically fast, but the compositional process makes it neutrally buoyant. I should say the composition makes it positively buoyant. It's cold, that makes it negatively buoyant. And you put the two together for young slab, it's about neutrally buoyant. And so here are these slabs hanging out in the mantle, uh, apparently just happy where they are. Okay. A nuanced side comment to the side comment is if this is depleted, it's relatively free of garnet. In the cenosphere around it, with pressure, you get higher and higher garnet fraction. So it gets denser and denser compositionally as you go down. So this may be buoyant compared to that. This may be negatively buoyant with respect to that. The whole slab may be hanging out just where it wants to be. If I push it down, it may actually float up, okay? If it gets warm and it loses the negative buoyancy due to its coldness, it may just blob up and become part of the bottom of the plate. Nothing sweeps it away, okay? I find all that fascinating. Um, Okay, um, well, this one, um, the actual load pulling this crust down, to me, if this is the depleted mantle, it's not doing anything. It's the eclogite that is still the ocean crust that is eclogized here, that's doing the work of depressing the moho in that one spot. Okay, uh, so here's the whole story. Did I put it in quotes? No, I should have. Um, okay, so here's the slab, it's pulled back. As it delaminates and pulls back, it's sucking crust into this area. So you thicken the crust by the load and just the flow that's driving things towards that. So here's a, some thick crust I've added to the picture. Okay. Uh, root falls out, slab breaks, floats down to where it wants to be. This area comes up because I've removed this load and I got the buoyancy of this thick crust that uh, we have images of. And that's holding up the outer ring. Okay. Uh, so now, so I finished the outer ring because I got the northern part accounted for. Oh, <laughs> make sure nobody's sleeping. Um, <laughs> uh, why did why did delamination stop where it did? Um, well, it seemed to stop right about where the 706 line wraps around here, and where the crust up north gets very thin. Okay, so I imagine the flat slab under this area is delaminating, delaminating, I guess the, the thin crust, I've kind of shown back here, 
the laminated, there's the eclogite, it's gone here. But up here, at shallower pressures, it's still basalt, okay? So it gets up to this place, um, and even with the force trying to pull it down, it has the buoyancy of the basalt saying, I don't really want to go down, okay? So the slab maybe just wants to stay here and not go down because of that buoyancy, and you can't create the eclogite as you pull, pull down into the hot, deep earth, okay? And giving support to that, uh, here is some more imaging from uh, Lavander and Miller. Um, this is a, the lithosphere cenosphere boundary, they call it, the LAB. Um, and it's a pretty kind of iffy imaging. It's not real profoundly strong, but what you see along this area is you see the, some, I don't know, 55, 60 kilometers depth they get to the lithosphere cenosphere boundary. You get to this area, and suddenly you see things thickening by about the thickness of the Fairlawn slab, if I just do a thermal model for how thick it should be. So it really looks like in this part of Washington, where magnetism has not happened yet today, except for these dikes that penetrated here, uh, it looks like we still have Fairlawn lithosphere here beneath that area. Okay, so it really looks like it just delaminated until it got to that point and couldn't go anymore. And I'm just hypothesizing this because the crust couldn't eclogize. Um, oh, one last slide. Um, oh, this is actually, I got that wrong. Um, but if you think about inside the bullseye area, the Wallawas that come up here, uh, relatively speaking, the Wallawa granites are low in density. The root is high in density. So in terms of deviatory tension within the crust, here's where you get vertical tension. That would be where you'd expect basalt to be intruded as a sill. Okay. And indeed, when you go to what, nine kilometers, nine kilometers with the seismic velocity there, uh, you do see uh, what could be attributed, most reasonably could be attributed to a basalt sill, something high in velocity at that limited depth range. So it looks like we actually see the sill that separated the granite from the root that sank. Okay. And here it is. These fucking bullseyes to see where it is geographically. So it looks like what allowed the Wallawa Bathlift root to sink was removing the slab from beneath it. You lost that support, but you also injected a sill above it. So you've lost that support and not much is holding it into the crust anymore. Um, I might say if the sill is being inflated in the crust, uh, it's possible that it would produce a dome like structure. Um, and then as this sinks, we'll suck in and make a moat. And uh, I don't know, for geomorphologists, I keep trying to get somebody interested in this problem, uh, but here are the Wallows, and it's just fascinating to me. I, I take that point, all the streams radiate away from that point. That is very bizarre to see a stream running down the long axis of an elongated mountain range. Uh, it seems to me it could have been flowed off to the side quite easily. So I'm wondering if that stream pattern wasn't made before there was a moat, before the Wallawas were uplifted really, and you had this dome, everything just ran off. And once you establish those streams and they're entrenched, no matter what happens after that, they're still there. Okay, I would love to have somebody take that problem on, <laughs> who actually knows what they're thinking about and doing. Um, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, Okay, <laughs> so uh, let me finish with a few general lessons in all this. Um, a lot of vertical tectonics going on without being driven by horizontal tectonics. You know, we are all, all in the aftermath of plate tectonics where horizontal things create the vertical things. Here's a lot of vertical motion driven not by horizontal tectonics, okay, but by evolving density structure at depth. This is what the Russians thought was right before plate tectonics came along, okay? And it looks like they were right to a point. Um, okay, uh, lithosphere, continental lithosphere in particular, uh, with all that it's inherited through time can be very gravitationally unstable, but unable to go because things are just too viscous, okay? So if you do something to cut this stuff loose, uh, those instabilities are just embedded in the lithosphere and waiting for their opportunity. 
uh, much more than I would have ever imagined. I show two examples here, uh, the melt naval delamination of the old Fairmont slab, later the restite foundering of the lava basilic roof. Okay. Um, it looks like crust, at least in originic areas, can be surprisingly mobile to get the anisotropy pattern. Um, okay. Um, oh, and I emphasized that already, but slab, if the crust could come off of it, uh, can actually be stable in the upper mantle, okay, and not keep sinking, which is interesting. One last side comment. Uh, when I was a student, there was a big debate about whether we had layered convection, upper mantle, lower mantle, or if it's whole mantle convection. And when the image slabs going through uh, the transition zone, they said, aha, there's evidence for whole mantle convection. The geochemists were uncomfortable because they said, but the upper mantle is just the right volume for the history of the earth and subduction. That is all the depleted mantle we need uh, for this process. Well, it looks like it's completely possible either here or maybe even in the lower mantle that the, the crust eclogizes, is dense, sinks to the core mantle boundary. We see evidence of that coming up in plumes, all the rich mantle. And the depleted mantle, now invisible because it's no longer seismically uh, fast as it warms up, quietly floats back into the upper mantle and reappears. <laughs> so there's an interesting idea. Okay, I'll end with that. <laughs>